to Storytime for Grown-Ups from Pamunkey Regional Library. My name is Annalie Mills and I'm going to be reading to you today from this book, Sabrina and Corina by Kali Fajardo Einstein. The title of this story is called Galapago. The day before Perla Ortiz killed a man, she had lunch at home with her granddaughter, Alana. They sat together at the aluminum table in the small canary yellow kitchen and ate turkey wraps with a wet kale salad. Alana had stopped by on her lunch break. She worked downtown in a glass high rise for a marketing firm specializing in oil and gas and was dressed plainly in a brown shift dress, her lightened hair pulled high in a ponytail. Perla watched Judy Garland sing in black and white on the television above the refrigerator and methodically chewed kale her dentures couldn't easily break down. She preferred her usual flour tortillas with beans and rice, but she'd learned to humor her granddaughter, who, despite her prickliness, was good-hearted in her own way. We'll look at a few communities this week, get an idea of what's out there. Alana pushed a brochure across the table. She explained that it was for a senior home called Wellspring Acres, the print too small and too pale for older eyes. Alana had been suggesting for years that Perla sell her home on Galapago and rent an apartment in a building for seniors. The Denver housing market was booming, Alana often said, and retirement homes were much more chic than they used to be. Even houses on the west side were going for a half million dollars. But Perla had been on Galapago for 62 years since she married Avel, when they were first in the family on either side to own property. Grandma, did you hear me? Alana took a swig of water and used her thumb to clean a smudge on the glass. She spoke louder. It's more social, easier to take care of. Perla spit a ragged piece of kale onto her palm. She nodded before turning back to Judy Garland. That poor girl, how the world just ate her up. Alana stood from the table. She clicked off the television. Let's focus, Grandma. Perla laughed. Her granddaughter looked so bossy in her career clothes. But whenever Perla looked at her, really looked at her, she still saw Alana as an eight-year-old girl who'd come to live with her grandparents on Galapagos Street after her mother, Mercedes, died. Alana arrived with nothing more than a suitcase filled with stuffed animals and chapter books. Managing household grief became another task, as endless as chores. Avel sometimes cried beneath the forked apple tree in the backyard, and to hide his sorrow from Alana, Perla would close the windows and turn up the country music station, drowning out everything with a twang. Now. Thirty years later, Perla wondered if she should have let Alana hear her, him cry. After they finished lunch, Alana dutifully walked Perla to her bedroom, a dark space between the kitchen and living room where the windows had long ago been boarded up. In that little room, lighted by lamps, Alana got to work making the queen-size bed. Perla was embarrassed. There wasn't a day in her life she'd let a bed go unmade. But when her hands were particularly arthritic, she had trouble straightening the sheets and turning the quilt. She stood near the doorway over the crushed pink carpet and smiled as Alana finished, prideful as she fluffed pillows. You'd think I'd get a smaller bed since Abel's gone all these years, Perla said. Alana reached out, slightly smoothing her grandmother's white curls. Long as you're comfortable, Grandma. Before she headed back to work, they stood on the cement porch for a moment, the day unexpectedly pleasant for early March. Perla gazed beyond Alana's shoulders at the rows of west side houses, evenly spaced with wide porches and tiny square lawns. They were stout homes, some colorful, some beige, with chain-link fences and bared win barred windows. There were old street signs reserving parking spots for the elderly, handicapped neighbors but most of those folks were gone. While Perla was once friendly with everyone on Galapagos Street, now she knew almost no one. 
In the past decade, couples with expensive cars and Anglo names had moved onto the block, altering the houses and gutting the yards. Once, hacking down Miss old Miss Archuleta's prized peach tree in a single afternoon. I have no interest in leaving, Miha, Perla said, before kissing Alana goodbye. Hell, the Lord will take me soon enough. The District 7 police station was busy at six in the morning. Clerks drank coffee and shuffled papers, while criminals and victims shuffled in and out of fluorescent lit hallways. Perla sat for some time in a waiting room beside a stack of good housekeeping magazines and a fake plant that looked like a mini aspen tree. Alana arrived just before the detective called them back. She had applied a full face of makeup. She was shaking, much more than Perla, and had a dazed look about her as she clutched her black leather jacket close to her chest. The only crime committed was armed burglary, said the detective, a middle-aged man with clever eyes inside a very big head. His name was Ralph Virgil, and he had a jovial belly like a melon beneath his dress shirt. His office was a white cubicle with flattened brown carpet, the only decoration a free Mexican restaurant calendar, a month behind, pinned to the felt wall. He began speaking to Perla and Alana from behind a cherrywood desk, but soon stood and rolled his chair beside Perla. He swayed forward as he spoke, his arms resting on his bony knees. The locks were busted on the back door. The nine millimeter tucked into the young man's waistband was loaded. Case closed. A gun? How had Perla mistaken a gun for a knife? She stared at her reflection in the silver badge clipped to the detective's front pocket. Her face was long with clear hollows and her once dark hair was now a white nest. Without her usual rouge or lipstick, she appeared a ghastly gray, as if she were living in a black and white movie. Perla cleared her throat to make her voice seem strong. She asked, How old was he? Nineteen, the detective said. We get kids in here as young as fourteen who've shot up entire families, sometimes for nothing more than an Xbox. Count yourself lucky, ma'am. Oh, Christ! Alana threw her arms around Perla. The city is in flux, ladies. Lots of mixed income levels. They say things will cool down once the area is fully gentrified, but I'm skeptical. It's always been bad. I don't see how it can change, said Alana. You a West Side girl, Ms. Ortiz? Born and raised, but now I'm in Highlands. You mean the North Side? Como que Highlands? They laughed at that popular TV show t-shirt slogan Perla had seen young people wearing. Since the newcomers had started moving to Denver, they changed the neighborhood names to fit their needs to sound less dangerous, maybe less territorial. Perla said, you still haven't told me his name, Mr. Virgil. Cody, the detective clicked un flicked a non-dairy creamer packet into his coffee. The white powder clumped together and sank to the bottom. Cody Moore, Crime was always a part of the West Side. Their first break-in was in 1956, summertime. Newlyweds, Perla and Avell walked home from Benny's dance hall, their arms linked. It was a cool night, the moon a slit of light. Avell's unruly hair was greased to shine, leaving smears across Perla's neck as he kissed her on their cement porch. Sliding his calloused palms beneath her sal salmon dress, he unlatched her stockings and guided apart her thighs. They entered the room, ready to make love right there on the living room floor, but found the room ransacked. The thief had taken a box of silver jewelry from inside the bedroom closet. The next day, Avell and his cousin Benito welded iron bars over the windows. Perla began doing housework in the mornings to avoid the afternoon shadows that fell upon her home like a cage. For over 20 years, she sought out the stolen silver in pawn shops, once reclaiming a turquoise cuff from the glass case at an antique shop on South Broadway. Lovely piece, the Anglo saleswoman said. It'll look wonderful with your coloring. The second break-in was autumn of 1978. Perla and Avell were recovering from the hurt that their only child, Mercedes, had gone a bad way. She was addicted to alcohol and barbiturates, 
hitchhiking from town to town across the Southwest. In Bisbee, Arizona, after going to an all-night club with a dirt floor, she slept with a man whom she only remembered as having one blue eye and one green. Pregnant with Alana, she returned to Denver, got a little apartment, a respectable job selling office supplies on 16th Street, and threw herself a baby shower that was only attended by her parents and her best friend, a warm-hearted gay man named Miguel Orlando. Within a decade, both Miguel and Mercedes would be dead, she of hepatitis and Miguel of AIDS. But the shower was beautiful. The four of them devoured far too many tamales and slices of tres le leches cake, the party going on until after midnight as they shared family stories and their aspirations for the baby inside Mercedes. It's going to be a girl, Abel said to Perla, back home on their porch swing. A strong one. He slid off his cowboy boots, allowing them to air out in the night. For a moment, the couple sat with their joy. When Perla headed inside, nothing was unusual about the house until she entered the bedroom. In the far corner, broken glass glinted across the oak floor. Squinting upward, Perla looked to the shattered window, where a small child was perched between the iron bars, its legs dangling as if it sat in a tree. The child stared at Perla, the light inside its eyes suspended as it swooped from the window ledge, fading into the alley, taking with it the diamond necklace Avel had given Perla after hitting the jackpot on what he thought at the time was a lucky slot machine in Central City. The next morning, Perla asked Avel to nail wooden boards over the bedroom window, blocking the room both from blocking from the room both thieves and sunlight. It took some getting used to, but the darkness grew on Perla. She draped the boards with pink satin and decorated the walls with colorful gauzy scarves. One night, after the boards were up for nearly two years, Perla dreamed of the child with light eyes, its legs sliding beneath the satin, moving like tentacles over everything in sight. Perla then purchased a silver-plated pistol and placed it in her stockings drawer, never believing she would actually fire it. A week after the shooting, though Alana had paid for a professional cleaning service, Perla still found blood dried between cracks in the kitchen walls. She made a solution from vinegar and salt, sponging away the brown mess as she waited for her granddaughter. They were to visit a senior home, a community called St. Lorena, no St. Perla had ever heard of, but it had been decided after the young man's death that Perla was leaving Galapago, and that was that. As she hunched over and cleaned the walls, Perla fought her mind's tendency to drift. In the canary yellow kitchen, the lace curtains rising and falling from brass vents gushing heat, she saw Cody Moore's stomach muscles in a defined V as he reached for what she thought was a knife. His fingernails were wide and chewed, and his saucer-like green eyes were dryly blank. How had she not noticed it was a gun? Was Perla that blinded by old age? And did it change things that, like her, the boy was carrying a weapon? Knives kill people all the time, but guns killed them more. One thing Perla was certain of. She was ashamed that even in her old age, she wanted to live more than die. After she had finished in the kitchen, Perla dropped the sponge into a trash can and went outside to gather the day's mail. She accidentally marked a bundle of coupons in reddish-brown fingerprints as she waited on the porch for her granddaughter to arrive. The most noticeable thing about our residence is their collective smile. Alana and Perla listened to a tour guide, a young redhead in a goofy kitten sweater. They were paused in the lobby of St. Lorena, overlooking the ice of Sloan's Lake. Everything was vanilla-hued with mahogany trim. Skylights illuminated the hallways, where residents curved over aluminum walkers. The tour guide pointed out the wooden rocking chairs facing the mountains, the baby grand piano in the recently renovated dining hall, and the locally designed iron screens over the brick fireplaces. 
Perla asked if there was a Catholic church nearby. Certainly, and Mass is performed in Spanish two times per day, noon and five o'clock. We speak English, Alana said, matter-of-factly. The tour guide looked as though she wanted to apologize. Perla said, Thank you, Pumpkin. Church is important to me. The next stop on the tour was an apartment belonging to a 78-year-old woman who was visiting her grandchildren in Lake Tahoe. It was a studio with stucco walls and taupe carpets. A twin bed covered with a childish purple comforter occupied space in the far corner beneath a painting of a blonde Jesus. The tour guide explained that the apartment was a popular choice for independent elderly women, rather than using the word widow. Where does she keep all her things? Perla asked. Her furniture, her clothes. The tour guide relaxed her face. She had kind green eyes. Learning to separate ourselves from unnecessary clutter is one of the hardest aspects of transitioning out of an independent living situation and into a community home. Perla said she had no more questions, and they moved on to the cafeteria, where a rack of gray roast beef warmed beneath a heat lamp. Alana was late. You drag yourself to mass this morning? She told her grandmother not to start with any church talk. They drove the freeway to the cemetery without conversation, the radio on a news program. As they entered Mount Olivet's iron gates, clouds seemed to clear and sunshine brightened the headstones and mausoleums. They first drove by the graves belonging to rich folks, those with marble angels and stone beacons. All her life, Perla had put money aside for a respectable grave, prematurely using the money for Mercedes, giving her daughter a proper stone. Her own parents were buried in the desert with only wooden crosses to mark their bones. The crosses decayed over time, crouching into the earth, until one summer on a road trip to the Saint San Luis Valley with Avel and Mercedes, Perla couldn't locate her mama and papa's graves anymore. She left wildflowers and sage near a mile marker that seemed close enough. They don't mow regularly? Alana asked, prying crabgrass from her grandfather's grave. Perla's own headstone was beside it, an open dash for her death date. Not on our side, Perla said, referring to what the archdiocese used to call the Spanish section. It was near what were once referred to as the Oriental and Negro sections, across the tracks from the suicides and unbaptized babies. The rules weren't enforced anymore. The families were buried near one another, and so things stayed intact. Perla rummaged through a plastic grocery sack on her side. She pulled out wash rags and spray bottles. She handed some to Alana. Start with his name and the dates. I'll get to the backside. The vinegar solution spread into the headstone, releasing an odor like rust. Alana was decent and kind arching her back and rolling up her coat sleeves before she scrubbed. Perla had to give the girl that. She had never been lazy. Always a hard worker. Avel's headstone was soon brighter than it had been. The wind was calm as Perla placed plastic marigolds beneath his name, the orange petals only slightly wavering against the yellow grass. The women then prayed the rosary, the hard beads slick in their hands. From a distance, the section of the cemetery where Mercedes was buried seemed like an empty field. It was only standing directly above the graves that Perla could read any names. Destiny Dixon, Sabrina Cordova, Susana Mullins, and there, toward a chain-link fence beside the train tracks, Mercedes Angelica Ortiz. Perla loathed standing over graves, worried she was stepping on a face or a chest. Maybe it was because when she was a little girl, a priest had once told her that hell was really just a grave. Hi, Mama, Alana whispered. She kneeled and yanked massive weeds from the flat headstone's corners, the roots held by frozen dirt. Years ago, she'd spoken of buying a nicer plot for her mother, but over time she'd changed her mind, or worse, maybe she'd forgotten. We miss you, Mama. We miss you so much.
Perla, Perla cupped her mouth with both hands, holding in a choking cry as she stood on the dark, dead grass above her daughter's feet. She always expected Avel to go first. It seemed the usual way, but when Mercedes passed, it stole something from inside her, a bone she couldn't quite name. I pray for you, my baby, every day. On the drive home, Alana said, We have a move-out date for you, April 1st. If your grandfather was alive, Miha, he would be ashamed to live anywhere but our home. Perla glanced out the window at identical housing developments rolling over the foothills. They reminded her of locusts devouring the land. I hope he doesn't somehow see any of this. Alana seemed stunned, taking her eyes off the road, almost looking directly at her grandmother. Some drug addict came into your house with a gun and tried to kill you. You're not staying there, Grandma, and that's the end of it. Perla went quiet then. She wondered about Cody. Was his body in a cemetery? Was it near a freeway or train tracks? Did he have, at the very least, some flowers? Even plastic would do. The night it happened, Perla dreamed of a memory, only different. She was seven years old and still lived in Sahorita, where her papa worked in the mines. They had a company house, a one-room cabin without electricity or heat. The floor was dirt, and the ceiling was patched with grass, where, sometimes, blue sky winked and snow drifted down onto their bed quilts. Perla ran between the mountains, the land beneath her feet jagged with quartz and sagebrush, her little body a blur of white lace and black braids. It was church Sunday, and she was late. When Perla's legs couldn't carry her any faster, the wind picked up and she lifted over pine trees and the mirrored ponds where she saw herself sailing toward that adobe steeple with her arms open to the land. Perla awoke at half past two when the pressure in her gut surged all the way to her throat. For a moment, she sat motionless in bed, surrounded by rosaries and unlit candles across her nightstand. Perla reached for her flannel robe, laid out beside her on the mattress, but a feeling stopped her. She held her breath and listened. There was something in the kitchen, a small metallic rattling, the creak of redistributed weight. The sounds entered Perla's body like a vibration in her bones rather than her ears. Perla prayed. She asked for help from everyone, Mercedes, Avel, her mama, and papa. A vision came to her, a young Anglo man with an exhausted heart, nearly dead as he shivered in a room without windows, without lights. Don't aim a gun, Avel had once told her, unless you're prepared to kill what, what's standing in front of it. With her robe buttoned clear to her throat, Perla reached for the silver-plated pistol in her stockings drawer, her heart beating so loudly that she feared it would be overheard through her rib cage. Perla walked into the kitchen, where a young man was bent over, fumbling with the locks on the basement door, the stove's electric light shining across his shaved head. When he turned to face Perla, for a long second, their eyes met. How dull and vacant, how wasted and long. There was nothing of great value in the house, the basement in particular, only old paint cans and fishing nets with rusted metal handles. What an unfortunate misunderstanding. Time began to move oddly, slowly and flat. Perla was certain Avel would be coming through the front door at any moment. The young man would run off down the alley. The old couple would talk of saving money in laundry or borders, anything to afford a home in a better neighborhood, maybe north toward the Italians on Lowell or east toward the Jews by the university, anywhere but Galapago. But that life was done. The young man snapped into movement, reaching for something in his waistband, a knife with a dark blade. Perla shivered in pink slipper socks, her pistol aimed. She said, please, please. The young man could not focus. It looked as though his eyes were uh, borrowing his body. He stepped forward once. There was a blue sparrow tattooed on his right forearm, a name written beneath the wings. When Perla pulled the trigger, 
The young man's body went lax and dropped to the linoleum floor as reddish spray exited his right side, splattering the eggshell kitchen walls. I aimed low for his legs, Perla told the 911 dispatcher. Gasping between tears, she repeated, I aim low. Elena cleared Perla's vanity, pulling photos of Mercedes and Avel from the mirror and placing them in the shoebox. She had already packed most of the kitchen while Perla stood by, watching in wonder as her granddaughter tossed out expired boxes of pancake mix and old jars of Mrs. Archuleta's peaches. She was moving in three days. Perla shuffled around in the bedroom's lamplight, taking stock of what she needed. She had drawers filled with dried Revlon nail polish, tubes of coral lipstick worn down to stubs, empty bottles of Chanel No. 5. But what was empty when you could always squeeze out another drop? The closet was jammed with hand-sewn dresses, worn decades ago at some dance or baptism. Beneath the bed were boxes of hats that had long ago gone out of style, come back in, and gone out again. Avel's cowboy boots lined the closet floor, a pointed row of ancient leather, all of it junk, and all of it precious. Alana, Alana said, I know it's hard, Grandma, only taking what you need. It's not like I'll take any of it with me when I'm dead, said Perla with some hes hesitation. Might as well start now. Alana asked her grandmother why she must say such morbid things. Perla flapped her hands in the air as if to say, What? How do you mean? She then lifted an amethyst necklace from her vanity. It was a gift from Avel the year before he died, a small heart-shaped stone with golden roses along the sides. Perla looked deeply into the stone's color and noticed it had changed into something warmer, brighter, but she soon realized that it was only a ray of sunlight. Following the warm line, she discovered a small roundish hole had developed in the wooden boards covering her bedroom windows. Perla pushed aside the pink satin and examined the wood, smoothing her palms over the brittle surface. Miha, she said with sudden urgency, let's get this down. Deep inside the closet, Alana retrieved a hammer from Avel's orange toolbox. She jimmied out the rusted nails, bottom to top, until the dusty boards dropped with a crash. And for the first time in 40 years, the bedroom was flooded with light. Thank you for listening today and uh, hope that you'll join us next time for Grown Up Storytime with Pamunkey Regional Library.